Is that all right from the angle there? That's that's good, bro. So uh, yeah, Zach, mate, thanks for joining me, brother. Um, how you been, mate? You're, you're back in the bay with mum during lockdown, is that right? Yeah, bro. I just um, thought I'd come back to the bay. Well, actually, before sort of lockdown kicked off, and I just uh, ended up staying here. It's awesome to be home, catching up with. Well, not catching up, but you know, being around <laughs> family <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you've know, been around family, just familiar surroundings and stuff. So it's been pretty good. Yeah, mate. I see you're bloody um, training the house down, bro. Jeez, I'm getting, getting jealous watching all these people run, <laughs> mate. Like, I blew my blew my calf on the first day of lockdown, bro. So I haven't been able. To, you know, like you know, I enjoy running. So when I yeah. see your posts of you just running everywhere in the sun, mate, I, I get a bit envious, mate. What's what's all that about, mate? Training for something? Oh, I don't know. Nah, I'm not training for anything in particular, but just trying to stay sane, actually. Eh? Like, um, I don't know. I sort of use exercises. Um, as a bit of a, it's a hobby, but also like it keeps my mind clear as well. Um, so it's, it's I, I don't know, I couldn't even run like 3K two weeks ago continuously. And then I was like, man, I've got to try to test myself. Then I moved up to like, se- managed to do five, then seven, then 10, and then 21K yesterday. So yeah, I don't know, it's out of my comfort zone. So it's a challenge. Sub two hours, mate, that's pretty respectable too for a first half marathon just off the bat. <laughs> yeah, I was like, um, Man, and when I first started running, I was like, I'm just going to plod here. My first K was around six minutes. And I was like, I started to feel a little bit good. Then I was like, well, I'm going to try and do this under two hours now. And um, one hour, 59 or 59 seconds or something. So I got there. Just scraped in. <laughs> just, just scraped in, bro. Yeah. No, it's good. Like, I, I've actually enjoyed the running now. Was, um, I used to hate it. I used to tell myself, oh, I'm not, you know, I'm no good at long distance running so I'm not going to do it I used to break it up into intervals and stuff like that but uh, yeah that is actually um, quite enjoyable yeah and it's a, it's a bit different coming from from sort of body stuff eh, bro, where it's a l- little bit more explosive short and sharp um, you don't sort of train like that eh, with, during footy it's more that short sharp sort of stuff eh? yeah well yeah as you said with footy like I don't know the further sort of amount you'd run and sort of, well would be like maybe when you're in season like 50 meters but short as you said short sharp stuff so i was doing a lot of that and i was like i thought to myself well not going to be playing rugby anytime soon because of the current situation we're in so i might as well try something a little bit out of the ordinary that sort of tests the top two inches a bit more and yeah managing to um sort of dig up a lot of emotional stuff as well which is which is pretty cool and so i used to use training just to i know suppress it was an escape for me yeah as well so it's um yeah, and that long distance running is handy for that. You've got heaps of time to think. Yeah, it's, especially now, eh, bro, the current climate, like, people, you know, always ask me, why you run all the time? And it's the exact same thing, bro. Like, it, it definitely wasn't physical, and it's not like I was always training for something, but for however long, that half an hour, that hour, whatever, it's just you, your thoughts, and just grinding it out, eh? It's, it's just a good release, you know, physically, mentally, emotionally. I've, I solve all the world's problems in my runs, bro. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, I just used to run to try and switch off. But yeah, yesterday, 21K, you know, so well, I'm going to try and catch my thoughts and emotions and feelings and stuff like that. So the same sort of, yes, just what you're talking about then, you know, I was like, I started to think really clear, probably the clearest of thought <laughs> or, or lockdown between like, I don't know, 5 and 15K. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, no, it was cool. Nice, man. And um, you said you're back home, you're with mum, just... Who you, uh, who you hunkered down with, bro, during lockdown? Yeah, just my mum and uh, her partner. We're actually doing all good. Like, uh, we, you know, we don't get up in each other's face too much and <laughs> sort of know the boundaries. Yeah, yeah, but, um, yeah. no, it's been all, all smooth sailing. I had lots of um, games of euchre and I've been fed well, so I um, I can't complain, mate. It's all going it's all going pretty good at this end, but... Um, I guess we'll find out more to Monday, eh? If we yeah, yeah, extend yeah. our bubble or however that looks. So, um, yeah. but I'm actually quite quite happy um, doing what I'm doing here at the moment. It's like been a real sort of, I guess, bit of self discovery for myself and time to reset. Yeah, yeah, same here, bro. I'm, like I told you, I'm, I'm, I'm hunkered down with mum too. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been good and definitely there's been plenty of time for oh, that, cool. bro. Because I'm by nature a pretty, you know, hyperactive guy. So, this has tested me a fair bit. And the fact that I can't run is kind of. Yes, yeah, so I had to try to do other things, eh, bro? I've been walking, like, How, oh, freaking hate did you, walking. Is your calf gone? Well, it's just, like, I, I can kind of get up to a little jog and then it just goes. 
So I've just been oh. bloody um, looking like 30 cent walking around with a bloody rockets <laughs> on and dumbbells just trying to trying to elicit some sort of uh, res- cardiovascular response. But oh man, it's been a great. Yeah. And then like you said, mum's cooking and mum's a big baker and stuff. So I've been battling. That's, when, <laughs> that's when you need um, one of those watt bikes, eh? So if um, yeah. anyone's yeah. listening and they can give us a deal on a watt bike, that'd yeah. be great. <laughs> I'd kill for something, bro. Well, just, a, just a bike. Like, I, I, didn't yeah. think, I didn't think it through very well. I, I sort of just decided, right, go you know, look after mum and the sisters. And then like literally nothing here. I, I had two, two kilo dumbbells and that was it. I've been walking around the backyard. Oh, wow. Like it's a water and shit. And it's like, oh man. Doing pull ups. <laughs> There's on only the so much you get. Yeah. yeah, doing pull ups on the carport. It's just like, oh man. But it is what it is. Only... And I'm not, I'm not the only one happening. So, mate, um, I it's guess. Good. I think it's given it building. I, sorry, bro. I, I guess oh. most people listening probably know who you are. But if they don't, then obviously, um, they might have either been in a coma or just don't like rugby for the last 15 years, mate. Um, <laughs> so, you know, obviously, you know, all black, played a few games for the Canes and Crusaders, uh, Tars, and then um, did a, had a couple of stints overseas. Um, mm. Also come back and did a bit of Heartland Rugby, bro. Uh, we'll probably touch on all of that at some stage during the interview. Just for people that might not know you, or you want to just tell us where it all started, mate. Tell us about uh, where it all began and, and a bit of your upbringing. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I was born in the Wairarapa in, in Masterton, which is... Um, pretty small place for all that people that don't know us down the bottom of the North Island, um, not too far from Wellington. So we, I grew up in Greytown, um, got with mum, dad and um, one younger brother, Victor, and rugby pretty much become life. I don't know, we, dad did it, so automatically like I fell in love with it. Probably, um, yeah, grew up throwing the ball around the backyard, then we moved to Napier uh, when I was 10. Went to Napier Boys High School. Um, then I was uh, quite lucky when I was in my last year of high school. Like rugby started progressing um, quite quickly, and I was signed for the Magpies in my last year of school. And then um, yeah, from there it just like went whoosh. Like all of a sudden, you know, I was playing with my bros at high school, then Magpies, and then Hurricanes. At like man, that seems like a a lifetime ago now, but um. And some awesome experiences there and something I'll be grateful for. But yeah, my love for rugby just came with following my dad around, really. Um, he played for Greytown. Um, then we moved up here, played for Tech. Uh, played, played for White Upper Bush as well, a team I played for. So yeah, that's where that's where the love for rugby stemmed from. Nice, bro. Now, you mentioned that you were, you were in the system pretty early. Um, and like, I mean, you played age group, you played secondaries. Twenties, I believe, and then you, you follow that system. And you're pretty, you're thrown into the limelight really young. But I, you know, 18, uh, 18, 19, you're fully professional. Um, and I, you know, if you listen to my um, podcast with Chris and Dan, you know, they, they took a slightly longer route, the Battlers route, Chris was calling it. Um, you, on the other hand, bro, eighteen, straight out of school, fully professional. Uh, with the beauty of hindsight, bro, do you think you were really ready and really knew what you're in for? Um, given your age, and sorry, was there enough? Was there enough adequate support around you, bro, at that time? Um, no, I definitely wasn't ready for that. At you know, 17, 18. Um, man, I went from like, you know, hanging out with my my boys playing first fifteen. Next next year was sort of Hawks Bay and Hurricanes, and um, I didn't have any life tools or any life experience. I didn't know, um, you know, the value of money. I went from trying to scab 50 cents at the tuck shop to buy a pie to all of a sudden being on a hundred thousand dollars fully professional rugby player within a, a year and yeah I was doing you know I was playing good footy but um I didn't really have time or the knowledge or I guess the su- support in place where I could sort of um I don't know put my personal life to use in a good way you know like only now I'm in that transition period out of rugby. I'm I'm having to do it now. And hindsight, if, you know, if I had done it 18, 19, this transition would be a lot easier and smoother. But because um, I thought I was awesome and um, had life sorted at 17, 18, I'm, I'm uh, having to pay the price now a little bit. 
Oh yeah, and I can only imagine, bro. Like, you know, I'm all your, I'm nearly forty. I'm still trying to figure things out, mate. So, <laughs> <laughs> trying to um, trying to jump into that sort of position that you were in at eighteen must have been um, must have been really difficult in some respects, but also pretty good in others. Um, and fulfilling that, I guess, a childhood dream really young. Um, how was that transition, bro? Like you said, um, going from you know, birth of being club footy uh, to Super Rugby within like like a matter of twelve months. How how was that? It was like a, it seems like in, a, in another life I lived, you know. Um, I, like it was real, it was really fast, and I was just everything just sort of, it just sort of happened. Like a, there was no real plan that I put in place or anyone else put in place and said, right, you're going to go from playing first team one year to Super NPC and then Super Rugby the next year. Just it just sort of unfolded that way. Um, I kind of always worked, like, trained pretty hard um, because I've got, like, quite a um, hard-out, addictive personality or, like, you know, I do everything. If I do something, it's going to be at 100%, you know, all the time. So that's something I'm learning to deal with as well. Um, but, yeah, it was, a, as you can say, like, it was a dream come true, but it probably just unfolded too quickly for me. Um, but yeah, I had some awesome times playing at Taradale with you and, um, you know, the Hawks Bay lads. And then, man, I remember walking into my first Hurricanes <laughs> session, like, at, what, 18? And Ma Nunu was in. I was just like, wow. And I just, like, sort of dropped my nuts and said day to him. He just went like that. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's sort of the old school, old school way. Um, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, so but then you know I got to know him really well. Now we're we're good friends, sort of thing. But um, you didn't really get too much out of the older players um, back then. If you were just a young fella, you had to sort of earn the respect, which um, I guess it might have changed a little bit now uh, in our days, bro. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned the um, uh, the mighty chariot. I'll probably one of the highlights of your career playing uh, for us, mate. Um, yeah, I remember you coming <laughs> along. <laughs> yeah, right up there with uh, all black baby bro. Um, I, remember you, I remember when I first met you, and me and my wife, we were just talking about this the other day, because um, I used to go on about you, I said, man, there's this young kid, man, he's, kid, he's got a motor, he, he's got some balls too. Um, I think I first played with you, one of the, one of the mount tournaments, you would have only yeah. been 15 or 16, and I was like, who's 16, this young, yeah. yeah, who's this young fella, man, he goes hard, he goes all right. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, I like, obviously got to know you a little bit, and then it sort of follows your progress, and it just, yeah, it just went like that, and that, and that. Um, I always uh, rate myself in sort of um, picking uh, picking players in early age, mate. So yeah, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, bro. Tarot was good for me. I mean, um, yeah, we had some good memories there. Like, you know, myself and Dan Kirkpatrick, I think we were fifth form when we started coming along, maybe. So yeah, 15, 16, and then quickly um, progressed into like playing sevens with you older fellas. Um, <laughs> Like <laughs> no, Prem's level at like sixteen and that's that's I think where my game sort of started to grow a little bit. Um I think one Y Park tournament I'd um I think we lost to Havelock in the final uh, two thousand and six or yep. no, two thousand five. Five. Six, six. It was yeah, six. It was six, yeah. Yeah. Two thousand six we lost to Havelock in the in the final and um Aaron Hamilton um was watching and then he got Gordon Titchens to call me like that next week when I was still at school and I remember having Nokia blue phone and talking to Titch outside the gym and I was like what the hell is going on here so that was sort of like the first time I was sort of I don't know talked to anyone of sort of significant importance in terms of um like making steps progressing through yeah. rugby so that was um that was pretty cool but I put a lot of that down to the work I did with you boys uh, at Taranel through sevens and that nice bro now we talked about playing for the Hurricanes, um, and then you signed with the Crusaders, mate. You had about sixty odd games there. Um, just for those that, I mean, what is it about that team, mate? They just seem like they just tune out players. They seem to have a good system. Um, how did you find it there? Um, obviously, your game sort of developed a bit more with your time at the Crusaders. Yeah, well, my um, my second year at the Hurricanes, I I was actually playing. I started the season off um, on the left wing then my form wasn't that great and I ended up on the bench so I uh, <laughs> behind David Smith and Jose Gear. so 
um, I, I packed a bit of a sad and Todd Blacker rang from the Crusaders and um, yeah, later, oh, about halfway through the year, I ended up signing with the Crusaders and that was cool. It was like, I don't know. I, I think just the humbleness of everyone down there and they're willing to work hard mm. um, is sort of a big trait in why the province or why the Crusaders, um, I guess, are like Melbourne Storm, like, hey, with that tag. Um, yeah, like all sort of down to earth blokes work hard. Like, no one worked harder than the two leaders, Richie and Dan. Like, you know, they were always sort of the first. Set pretty good examples, but um, never managed managed to win a title though when I was there. Oh, didn't you, mate? Oh, okay. No, it was there. I played there for what uh, four years, I think. But um, semi finals all the time and one final. So um, yeah, that's something I haven't ticked off, and I don't think I will. Well, <laughs> um, and obviously, mate, your yeah, mate, yeah, yeah, years of Super Rugby, second year with the Canes, I think. Was it when you got an All Blacks? Major All Blacks debut, uh, 09, was it? 09, 09, yeah, I just, so, yeah, yeah, the end of year tour, 09. So, yeah, against, uh, your, your major debut against Wales at Cardiff, mate. Is that right? Yeah. What a place to make your debut. 80,000 screaming Welsh fans. How, how was that experience, brother? Um, as, I, as I said before, like, I was like, <laughs> what, 20? <laughs> so it was, like, it was like, like now I'm thinking if I had to play for the All Blacks now, I'd be shitting myself, you know. But back then I was 20. I actually like slept about, I think the game was six or something. And I, I slept most of the afternoon. I was just like on sort of autopilot, you know. <laughs> I, um, but it was cool. Like, yeah, 90,000 people. I remember like I'm singing Bread of Heaven and stuff. And I'm trying to catch a high ball. And, you know, got the whole Welsh team coming down here. Like, but it was cool. Like, awesome experience. and. Um, yeah, people can say they sort of played at a place like that on debut, so I'm pretty lucky. Um, but yeah, just one of those moments that just went pretty quickly. Eh? Was, um, yeah, I guess I was still at that age where I didn't quite take everything in, but man, it was awesome. And just on that, mate, we've talked about you know with other guys around the, the IDM Cup environment and Super 12, and then I guess All Blacks, you know, the, the top echelons. What's the environment like, bro? And how different is it to say Super Rugby environment? I'd imagine it's completely different. Um, but yeah, what would your take or recollection of being in that environment, bro? Um, all Blacks environment. How would I describe that? I mean, when people ask, I said, they said, how hard's the training? You know, they think like we're put through some SAS training and stuff like that. And I'm like, physically, it's no. Physically, it's not a a step up. You know, like you don't have to be. Yeah. All this stuff. Some sort of, uh, yeah, mentally, bro, mentally, like, you have to be locked in. And if you don't know your um, your role or, you know, where you're supposed to be in, in this play on the paddock or, you know, you're not doing your homework and your book and you're not up to scratch, that's where you really get found out. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's just a big mental switch. Like, it's a total step up from ITM Cup into Super Rugby, then all of a sudden you're way up here, you know. So, yeah. um, some players adapt really fast, but I didn't. <laughs> Yeah. Talk to us yeah. about that. What do you mean? Just struggled a bit um, mentally, maybe? Yeah, yeah, I think struggled a bit mentally. Like, you know, as I said, like things happened for me really fast. Um, and I probably didn't adapt mentally, physically, and I guess um, how I played was all right. But was when we weren't on the field, when we were away, you know, like, um, I don't know. Yeah, I just, I was 20 years old. I didn't really know, <laughs> didn't have the tools or anything yeah. or. You know, to be an All Black, I was just still being Zach, um, you know. Yeah, and I guess that, you know, for, for anyone, that must be tough, mate. It's, um, this, you know, rugby is a religion here. The All Blacks are, are just on this pedestal and just jumping into that environment can either really, you know, some guys can really um, soak it up and it can enhance their game and their, and, and their lives. But I guess it, it, it can also yeah. be overwhelming. And I'm figuring it was a little bit for that. For you at the start anyway, bro. Yeah, it was pretty overwhelming. I mean, that's a great way to put it. Like, in 09, I'd, I'd lost my dad. So it was, um, you know, as, as much as I wanted to make him proud and playing rugby, I didn't have the life skills for everything else that sort of come with being a professional rugby player, especially for the All Blacks. But, um, and that sort of, I sort of run out of that uh, emotional charge and probably after 2011 World Cup where, um, Rugby just wasn't enough to keep me going anymore, mm. and that's probably where I started to 
find out find a little bit of difficulty off the field. So, um, yeah, you can have you know all the all the rugby skills and stuff like that, but if you sort of I I wasn't really applying it off the field, then life become pretty tough. But um, yeah, I had some awesome memories. Um, <laughs> 2009 to 2011 with the All Blacks anyway. Yeah, you, you touched on your um, you touched on the passing of your father, and you also touched on some off-field issues. I guess the two, it's fair to say, there's a link between the two. So you know, 2009, your yeah, you know, surreal experience. You've just won a world championship with the 20s. So your elation levels are here, and then within a matter of minutes, um, you find out your dad's passed in the crowd, mate. Um, only I can't even comprehend how that must have been for you, mate. Would you care to kind of take us through that and explain how that affected you, um, how that whole experience was? Yeah. So, um, man, I was, I was we'd just been in England, like I don't know, smoked them in the final. So obviously pretty high on emotions. Managed to get a, a couple of meat pies as well. So I was feeling extra special. And then, <laughs> um, yeah, we just lined up for our medal, and I looked up in the stand and. Um, my mum was crying and my dad had passed away, like massive heart attack. Um, and so I just went from like feeling like top of the world to rock bottom in the space of what, a couple of minutes. So um, that was hard, like really hard. And then I just, I sort of thought to myself that whole time, I'm just going to do whatever I can sort of as a rugby player to become an all black to make him proud. Mm. And then I, you know, as I, as we touched on earlier, I managed to do that and, late to only five or six months later but just put as I talked about my under attitude like an addiction to training or whatever I just become really addicted to being the best rugby player I could and that was like just I was just so emotionally charged that I was going to find my way to the trial line whenever I could so I could reach that goal for my dad and managed to do that and that was that was awesome so yeah in in some respects you know that that had a positive effect on, I guess, your, your, the way you played on the field. And I think there was evidence, just that intensity you played the game with, like you said, whenever you had the ball, it was kind of like, man, some, someone's going to go down, he's either going to try and beat someone or do his best to, you know. Um, but I guess also, uh, maybe later on, um, things started to unravel a bit and uh, um, the wheels kind of fell off. It was, you know, it's, yeah, fair to say. Oh, yeah, definitely. They well and truly <laughs> fell off. But, um, yeah, so, like, uh, as well as I use rugby as, like, a, I guess, almost like a suppressant to sort of switch off, um, you know, I was using alcohol, drugs, gambling, um, just as much outside of outside of rugby. So I didn't have those healthy tools that most people like, sort, of, sort of get throughout life or would sort of switch to after trauma like that. I just found whatever plaster I could, stuck it on <laughs> through whatever vice I could to sort of forget. And that, you know, and I did forget, but then, you know, um, later on, it sort of it sort of come out and, and not in good ways as um, you've probably seen the media and stuff like that. And by the time 2011 had finished, I'd sort of run out of that emotional charge to sort of, sort of um, play rugby as well as I had in the past. So I was just, doing it because it was the game I loved. But um, I didn't have that same passion and drive. You know, I'd already reached the top. So yeah. I was thinking, what else could I do? And that's when I started finding myself in mischief and trying to put Band-Aids, you know, on by doing things I shouldn't be off the field. So, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm still on that journey of self-discovery, but yeah. we're getting there. Oh, we all are, mate. And, yeah, I, I totally... I mean, not that I've... Well, I guess... You talk about reaching that ceiling, uh, and you see that in a lot of sports people, they reach the pinnacle of their careers, and then after that, it's kind of where to now. Um, and I'm not even going to try and compare my prowesses to yours, mate. But yeah, you know, I liken it to like you know, when I was doing my Ironman and endurance sport, like you train all year for this one day event, it's a 220k event. You do it, it's cool, and then it's like the days after, it's like what, where to now? Like what? Yeah. yeah. I just started, um, you know, I know when I finished my first one, I was like, yeah, cool, I've done Ironman. I started training, started eating, started drinking piss, and then, you know, before I knew it, there was 10 kgs, and I, you know, I wasn't this fit. <laughs> I wasn't this fit with yeah. the athlete that everybody had seen leading up to it. So it must be really hard to sort of... Yeah, well, even, even when you talk about it like that, like, um, 
like as a professional rugby player, like we build ourselves up for all week, all week for 80 minutes of rugby. And depending how that 80 minutes, 80 minute goes, 80 minutes goes, you sort of judge yourself on that. Yeah. So your whole week's built up for 80 minutes of rugby. Then Saturday, 9.30 at night or whenever it's finished, that's where um, you sort of draw your judgment. And I was like quite harsh on myself. So um, I was like my, I guess my own worst critic, you know? So if I had a bad game, um, I didn't obviously have tools. I would go on a bendy, you know? And, you know, I've got to try and put myself together by the time we go to training Monday. And sometimes, you know, if I had a bad game, I'd beat myself up till late Sunday night, you know, drinking, dragging, whatever it was. So um, not until early in my thirties now that I'm learning these tools that you don't need that stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I, I totally, well, you know, I get that to an extent. I, I haven't played at the same level as you, bro, but I can appreciate that um, frustration because as the public, and you're right, we just see the 80 minutes and we judge and, and judge you guys on the 80 minutes. We don't see all the shit that goes on before, all the trainings, all the mental games. like, And you've got this small window to sort of capture um, the nation in, in a positive light and never off game. Mm. You know, New Zealand critics in public are really harsh, uh, really harsh, as you would know. Um, how, how did you get on? Oh, I guess you kind of answered that, but just dealing with that public negative perception or or um, the negative sort of feedback from commentators and stuff like that, mate. Was it just as you said, just hit the piss, get on the bender and block it out? Well, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> you know, that's how I used to deal. That's how I used to deal with things. Just ah, oh, fuck it. You know, the fastest fix. Um, so yeah, well, definitely it's not not easy. Like he's, like I, well, like as prof- I don't know if I can speak on behalf of everyone, but me myself personally, you know, you sort of you hear all those bad things, and um, I'm actually quite a sensitive person, believe it or not, Faz. So I actually, um, sorry, man. <laughs> I actually, uh, I actually used to sit on that stuff for a long time, or like go through comments and stuff like that, and um, really let it affect me. And I, you know. And when I started um, stuffing up big time, like the Raritong incident and stuff like that, like journalists turned up on the doorstep, like, you know, at mum's house and stuff. It was just like, man, this is, this sucks. So it did really suck. But I guess these days I just ignore it now, you know, like what more, can, what more can I do? Like it's better off just trying to block it out. You know, we see, you see it, but um, yeah, it never gets easy. It's just, you know, yeah. case of tall poppy syndrome so yeah yeah when not, things are good things are good but when things are bad I you're know. gonna get drilled yeah and i know you know as like with rugby i said it's religion and as a nation you know as a rugby nation we we sing when we're winning but man when we're not man we can get pretty nasty which is you know just pretty sad in a lot of respects um so, so you sort of um finished up well you you, you applied your trade off off offshore um you went over and did a bit of time with the Tars. You did a couple of stints in France. All of those kind of probably didn't work out to be fair, bro. And you found yourself sort of yearning to be back home around family. Um, yeah, talk to us about some yeah, of those. Yeah, just. Oh, um, every time I've been to France twice and Australia once to play, and each time I sort of, I sort of set out. I was, I was with good intentions. I thought, right, this is it. I'm gonna make the most of it. It's gonna be awesome life-changing experience but um each time ended sort of ended quite badly um drugs alcohol gambling were involved again um but each one started really well like playing good footy um doing good things and stuff like that but then i think the lack of support i had around me my lack of understanding sort of beat myself up constantly so, you know, that's when I did get back into those vices and stuff and um, ended up getting on a plane and just coming home because, you know, I didn't have any, I guess, family support in, in these foreign places. Like the next um, step was to sort of come home before, you know, I did sort of do something really stupid. Um, so, yeah, I guess it is my safety net being back home in Hawke's Bay and, um, yeah, a place where I sp- spent a lot of time um, sort of finding out who I am. I mean, you've touched on, you know, addictions, you know, drugs, alcohol, gambling. 
um, for people that don't don't have addictions or aren't in that sort of uh, that sort of cycle, uh, I guess looking from the outside in, a lot of people would say, "Why you know you're earning big money? Why do you need why do you need a gamble? Why do you need a drink? What what you know?" Some people would say, you know, particularly with the All Blacks, like that's you know, he's got it all. Why do you need to do all that? Um, and it's probably, there was probably a yeah, frustration from you know, or a perception from the from the public that like, why? What do you say to those people, bro? Is it? It's, and I'm picking. It's not as easy as as they sort of put it. No, if I, you know, I look back and now, and I think this still trying to find those answers to a certain extent. Um, a lot of it was because I didn't like who I was. Um, a lot of it was I didn't think I was worthy of all the success. So, you know, going to self, self-sabotage self mode. Um, and I'd probably hit the top too early. Like there was nothing more yeah. I thought I could have could achieve. So, you know, I'd done what I promised I'd do to, you know, make my dad proud and stuff. Um, but I hadn't dealt with any of those emotions bubbling underneath. Anger, um, uh, sadness, all those sort of oh. things led me into a bit of a spiral of depression. So I guess that depression just made me do whatever I, I could to escape. You know, as I said, put that Band-Aid on, whether it be a, a bender on the piss or, or drugs, you know, you pull it off and it's still, you know, just bubbling away just as bad. So, yeah, I just... I was just in self-sabotage mode pretty much and um, didn't know how to get out of it. Yeah. Mate, I can, you know, I can relate a lot. I've had my, <clears throat> my problems with addictions. Uh, you know, I used to, you know, was hitting the piss a lot and, you know, as reckless and as um, hurtful as that behaviour is, it's insidious. It's just, it defies logic. It defies reason, eh? Like, yeah. you know it's wrong. You know you're hurting people. But you still do it, and you know I can totally relate to that and that self sabotage. It's like, you know, any normal person from the outside looking in is like, well, if you do this, this happens every time, irrespective. But it's not that black. Oh, yeah, and white. It's, almost, it's not that black no, and white when you're in the thick of it, eh, brother? No, nah, not really. Um, it's not. And what's the, the old saying about um, the re- repetition of the same behaviours without, you know, whatever is the definition of insanity? So yeah, doing the same thing. Know. Yeah. I know, yeah. like, but that's one that's so sticks pretty, in my head. Yeah, so pretty much like I was just doing all this shit that people wouldn't understand when, you know, they really thought I was living the dream. Mm. Um, but in my head, I was sort of just bubbling away, going crazy. And, you know, at that time, that was all I knew. Um, you know, I didn't grow up where and speak about emotions a lot around my family or my dad. Yeah. It's kind of... Um, hard for me to do so I wasn't vulnerable at all like I wasn't going to show any sign of weakness or admit to anything you know like I'm fine but really I wasn't and it's you get you get good at covering up or lying uh, when you're in the thick of it too eh, bro? oh bro yeah <laughs> it's, it's it's crazy like you know I don't don't want to live that life again you know I just um, really didn't like myself and um, yeah it was kind of hard to when you're in the sun. but um yeah now you you came home mate after a couple of um stints overseas and you ended up doing a bit of ITM cup um and then you went back to, went back to your roots bit of time with uh wide it up and like how, how was that experience it would have been like one contrast <laughs> going from fully professional all black super then you back to back to wow. rugby mate how was that yeah bro um, humbling. Funny you say that, bro. Very humbling, but I, I need to build from the ground again because I, um, that was why got tested positive for cocaine. So I come home, I wreck myself even more with, um, a few mates in Hawke's Bay, and then I woke up one morning and just had a realization that I need to get my shit together. So I, um, no team wanted me like I signed with Tasman, but um, they terminated my contract because they knew what had happened so no one wanted me so I had didn't really have um, anywhere to go in terms of rugby and then I thought well, what about going home and playing for what up a bush and that was cool bro like time my life to get myself back on my feet um, really humbling but like 
the passion for the game is just, um, you know, and you create friends at that level, like the grassroots level that you don't create in professional rugby. So that's something I was really um, grateful for. And then having my family there that would come and watch the games, my grandparents, aunties, uncles, and, and stuff like that. And But I tell you what, man, those boys don't mind a buffet breakfast the day before a game. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I'm thinking it wasn't a six-figure six, yeah. six um, salary, mate, with Bush. No, no, <laughs> it wasn't. A, uh, I got a little bit of pocket money for playing for them, but that was mostly around the work I did in the community as a as an RDO. So, no, bro, definitely not six-figure salary. <laughs> I was lucky enough to be um, lucky enough to be living on my grandparents up there, and they got a farm there, so um, nice. I was fed well. Nice work, bro. Now, you mentioned you just touched on um, some work in the community, and you've always, I mean, fair to say, amidst all the all the negative stuff, there's plenty of positives, and we've always been a, a sort of managed to get amongst the communities and do a fair amount of um, charity work as well, mate. Was that something that you were really conscious of and wanted to do in regards to giving back while you were playing, and even still now? Yeah, like I just try and put my hand up as, as much as I can, I guess. Um, there's lots of people out there that are, you know, as fortunate, but also, like, I've worked in a few schools and stuff um, in between rugby or while I'm just um, playing club rugby and stuff. And, man, I love working with kids, eh? So that's a passion of mine. Um, but also, yeah, I just like giving back, like putting a smile on people's faces where I can. And um, if that means going and chucking a ball around for an hour or two with some kids, and that's all good because, I'm, you know, when I was a kid, I would have loved for that to happen. Um, but yeah, that is a passion of mine, hoping uh, to, you know, extend that to work in, you know, as a teacher or social worker one day, I just need to um, put pen to paper and uh, get studying. Yeah, nice, mate, nice. Um, and then also, just most recently, mate, you had a stint with um, East Coast. You pro- probably couldn't get more heartland than this. Yeah, right. mate. That was that experience. <laughs> Oh man, East Coast is awesome. Uh, <laughs> how I ended up there was like, I come, I actually come back from France to play for, the plan was to play for um, Waikato, but um, yeah, and I thought that was going to, I trained with them from when I got back from France from February to June. Uh, I don't think the um, new coach Strawbridge really liked me too much, so I found out like Why? two. I don't know. I don't know. But um, I, he didn't actually re- even tell me. I heard it through the grapevine that um, I wasn't actually going to make the final squad, which was like two weeks before um, my team cup was starting or something. Two or three weeks before that, so I was sort of left in rugby terms with nowhere to really go again at that stage. So my mate from the coast rang me. He's like. Reva, come play, come play for us. We haven't won a game since 2013. I was like, what? You're not selling it, bro. I was like, <laughs> I was like, I was like, no, no, no way. And he's like, even if you could try and help us win one game, it'll be awesome. I was like, oh, I sort of thought about it, and then I, you know, I heard stories about East Coast rugby and stuff, and I was like, oh, yep, sweet. So, um, yeah, bro. Um, anyway, that was awesome. Like, boil up the night before a game, and boil up for breakfast, and. We didn't actually manage to win a game. <laughs> we come close. Um, we come close against Poverty Bay. I think it was our second to last game. Yeah. We're in the, um, we're in front by like. Thing. And then a few of us got injured and we didn't have a lot of depth. So, um, you know, I've tore my hamstring off the bone and then um, our fast Fijian winger, Pelly, he got injured and just the lack of depth sort of. I think they managed beating us by like three or four points or something in the end. But um, pretty pretty um, confident that the boys will get a win. Obviously not this year, but next year with Jose Gear and them coaching. So what's your um, sort of, oh, obviously your current situation, mate, is like the rest of us stuck home with COVID. Yeah. So what's plans post-COVID, bro? Are you, are you still looking to play footy do you still have desire to play footy and then also career wise what are you up to what have you got in the immediate future bro immediate tomorrow. yeah so um oh before this COVID stuff went now I was actually in talks to uh go overseas and play again um <clears throat> in Russia of all places um 
but yeah, obviously now this whole COVID thing, it's sort of that's blown out of um, been blown out of the water for now. Um, but if we if we can get back to playing rugby, I'll probably go and go back and play for Tech. Sorry, Chris. Oh, that's all right, mate. We'll, we'll let you off there, mate. We'll let you off. <laughs> but um, career career wise, bro, like I was, I really want to get into some study. Um, as I talked about before in the yep. social work or maybe teaching side of things. So um, I've actually been staying in my comfort zone and, and not expanding my knowledge. So I'm, I'm going to take a step out of my comfort zone and get that study underway once um, once we have a bit more clarity around what's going on in the world, eh? Yeah. Nice, bro. Um, and I guess, mate, just looking back, now we've talked, you know, we've talked about all things, footy, ups and downs. Um, and with the beauty of hindsight, mate, what, if you could, mate, what would you, what would you say to a 17-year-old Zach? What sort of advice would you give him, mate? If you could. <laughs> um, <laughs> put me on the spot, Fez. Um, <laughs> Oh, I would say learn as many life skill, skills as you can. If you know stepping into professional environment, you got to be armed with a pretty handy tool belt, and a, and I come in beer. So as many as those healthy skills you can add to a tool belt, whether that be um, you know I, I think that includes good relationships, um, knowledge, the boring things, you know, read books. Um, do the simple things. One thing that's really helped me now is surrounding myself with good people, with similar interests and stuff like that. Um, like the brother Watson, he's got the men group and that, that that's sort of helping me and morning routines and basic stuff, you know, that I saw yeah. through my 20s. Um, I'll tell the, yeah, I'll tell 17 year olds like a whole lot of things. Probably <laughs> give him a couple of jabs as well. <laughs> Um, so yeah, just you know, what are what are some of those things you do, bro, to sort of ground yourself? Um, you know, when times aren't tough, like what are some of the tools that you've maybe developed over the years? Because you obviously would need need to dip into that toolbox. What are some of those things you do, bro, just to really help and ground yourself? We've touched on exercise, obviously, but what else do you do, yeah. bro? Yeah. Um, just got into the stuff for one, and it's actually a morning routine, bro, and it sets up your day. So I start start my day with a um with a cold shower, um, gratitudes, uh, exercise, nice. a little bit of meditation, which is hard for me. Meditation is hard because my brain is just constantly on the go. To, so to actually, actually sit with myself and understand who I am is probably the, the hardest part. Nice. Phones and exercise and that sort of stuff. So it's a, my morning routine is a big thing. Um, Helps me at the moment. Um, yeah, I'm no, I'm no, uh, I was, I, I'm not there yet, but I'm, I'm definitely uh, a lot better person than I was five or six years ago. You know, but I'm, I'm just striving to um, add to that tool belt each day, really fast. Right. Nice, good to hear, brother. Um, and just in regards to, you know, we've talked about pro footy career, heartland career. Is, is there anything or things that you really miss around playing at that top level, bro? Or not at all, or? Um, oh, I miss testing myself against the best. Like, I love doing that. So that's, that's something I miss. I guess when, you, when I was in, when I was a professional rugby player, like, it became a bit like work. So I didn't, I didn't really love it, you know? And now it's not that I've stepped out of it. Like, I do actually love training. And so I guess I took things a little bit for granted, you know? Um, uh, obviously, you know, miss a lot of the cool friendships and stuff that you make over the years. But um, yeah, it's a, oh, the, the money would be nice again as well, and to put it to better use. <laughs> yeah, nice, bro. <laughs> <laughs> nice, um, now we touched on. Um, oh, Auntie Jacinda's going to make hopefully uh, an announcement tomorrow about mm. our immediate future, mate. What What are you missing most or, um, about being in lockdown, bro? What are you just Itching at the get into mate after lockdown. Oh, I'm missing those connections with you know that you have with the boys and going to you know Tuesday Thursday night trainings and yep. I guess um, that little bit of I guess escape away from and stuff like that. But um, 
Um, a few wicked wings are going to be nice as well, mate. <laughs> I'll be making my way through to the um, KFC drive-thru. Oh, but um, I'm... <laughs> that's going to be mate, that's going to be crazy, I reckon. Um, yeah. yeah, it will be. But um, not a lot. Like I've actually just appreciated this time to reset, ground myself, um, and yeah, it's um, I'm, uh, I'm, I've just tried to make the best out of, uh, I guess, a pretty average situation. So yeah, um, no, it will be nice extend our bubble or however that looks but um we'll see what happens come tomorrow yeah mate and you, you touched on making the most out of it you know it's not you know, when you think about it it's not that bad a situation i think chris was saying that you know if the worst part about this is having to stay at home with your family and people that are near and dear to you, you know, it can't be that bad can it eh? so exactly bro like our grandparents had or great parent grandparents had to go to war and stuff That's we just right. have to to stay home and worst case scenario watch a bit of netflix or go for a run you know like it's not overly tough as you said and uh, apart from training mate you've, you've um, developed any new skills or hobbies during lockdown mate instruments um no nah, bro i don't have a musical bone in my body and i'm pretty uh uncoordinated in that sense so I, i'm not even uh really going to try but um no, i've listened i've more just, uh, I've actually listened to a few podcasts and might listen to a Mark Hunt one and, and that was pretty cool. So, um, no, but mostly lots of training, eh? And I guess, um, yeah, I've been challenged for every minute of training I do to um, do a minute of either breath work or meditation. So, um, so that's been quite challenging. So, um, and you sort of dig up quite a bit of stuff, but um, I'm enjoying it. And now uh, you touched on... Um, I won't show you my haircut either. Oh, no, nah, too late, mate. <laughs> Put it back on. <laughs> yeah, uh, I did shave my hair off, but, um, yeah, this hat's become my best friend. Yeah, no, I'm, um, I'm a bit overdue, mate. No, nah, you're fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're fine. Nah. Um, mate, now you just you touched on some of those um, routines you go through and the work you've been doing with WAR. Um, you were fortunate enough to jump on one of the amend uh, walks er, earlier this year or late last year. How did you find that whole experience, bro? Was it? Uh, it was awesome, powerful way. Mm. Like you don't the total one. Yep. And you get you don't get often get fifty men together expressing their feelings in the um, deepest ways possible. So for me, that was um, awesome to sort of sort of share that space with those guys and and while being one of my good mates from school um powerful way like yeah. um all the stuff they do um I'd, I'd recommend it even if you don't have any issues it's um an awesome place to sort of go and discover yourself um for a really helpful yeah i was uh, fortunate enough to do the one here in napier last year and yeah man gotta agree it was i thought i was all right, put together, and then I went there, mate. And all of a sudden, you're in a circle with guys, you know, lying down, and then you just start crying for no reason. I was like, what the hell's going on here? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All these um, yeah, right. emotions, things you've suppressed. Um, I found it really helpful and just sort of left that walk with a, oh, I just sort of without that weight on, on me, bro. Yeah, I found it really helpful. Mm. Yeah. Yes. So I'm doing, um, a, a program with Wah and a few others. It's like a six week um, program I'm doing now. So I'm heading into my 24 hour fast tonight. And um, that's something I've never done before either. So that's what I've been doing during lockdown is a 24 hour fast each week. And um, as, as hungry as you get, like you sort of think a lot clearer around the 20 hour mark. So um, yeah. I might challenge myself to do 48 hours at some stage, but probably not. That's the hunger. It's like, wow, I can, I'm thinking really clearly and feel good. But um, I do find a lot of comfort in food, so it's hard for me. <laughs> well, mate, um, we, we're getting on in time. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just really grateful for, uh, for you jumping on, mate. It was pretty short notice. I, just, I think I just messaged you yesterday and you just said, yeah, no problems, fares, whatever. So really appreciate you uh, having you on board, mate, and sharing some of that some of you are the highs and also some of the lows uh, of, of, of being a pro footy player. And I've, I've said this in the past that, you know, the, the idea or the passion for this podcast 
is around connecting, having conversations, but actually talking to real people who mm. have been through adversity and been through tough times and are still working through them, bro. So I really um, appreciate you jumping on and sharing some of that, uh, particularly some of that sensitive stuff too, bro. So yeah, thanks a lot, yeah, brother. Bro. Nice to catch up, bro. And um, hopefully we'll be able to catch up further after this lockdown. Yeah, mate, we might have to go for a run together. You probably beat me now. <laughs> no, I won't beat you, bro. <laughs> I'm a plotter, but no, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. No problems, brother. Take care, mate.